Ah. Ah, hey. hello. Well, hey, hey guys. Hey, everybody. Hey. Hey, everybody. Hey. All right. Good to finally be here. No kidding. Yeah. Indeed. Right. Indeed, he's right. From all over the, well, I don't know. I don't even know where we're all from. So, <laughs> this is the internet age. Oh, here we go. Now we got the participants up. I can see everybody. There we go. Ten D, I need to know where you're at. You look like you're in the coolest, like, basement bunker. <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> is that Pete? Oh, no, no. Yeah. No one sees inside the basement bunker. <laughs> okay. um, no, no. This is just the precursor to the basement bunker. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's like an old master's painting there. It's cool. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Pete, do you do you moonlight as a DJ? Because you sure got the voice for it. <laughs> oh well, you know, um, uh, you know, I have not, I have not, but I have. Well, no, <laughs> no, I'm gonna stick with no for this. Yeah, I think you should say this is smooth jazz. I think you this can do that. Smooth <laughs> jazz. One of three yeah. All right. I think we're off topic though, aren't we? <laughs> oh, I think we I are. I see you doing a podcast in that little little space with that. <laughs> I think we're just giving it a minute or two to make sure everybody else is uh is is into the room before we All get right. started. So uh uh mm. talk amongst yourselves. Sure. All right. So where is everybody located here? I'm in Lakewood, California, which is near Long Beach. All right. All right. Nice. I'm in Tivoli, New York. Um, mm, which representing. Is, I was wondering, know, was it yeah. Danish shirt? I want to go even more. Yeah, no, no. And um, backwards. Read it backwards. Huh. Like it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> beautiful uh, Mid-Hudson Valley mm. of New York oh, State. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. not too far from that. No, uh, right across the river. Yeah. Oh, right on. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in New York too. So, hey. All right. Hey. Susan, are you in the city or? No, I'm actually at my parents' house, as you could tell by the uh, colonial dining room. So nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys all have cool camera gear. I'm at yeah, my parents' yeah, yeah. with the traditional <laughs> nice, Italian nice. getup behind me. Yeah. Whereabouts is that? Rockland County. So, actually, oh, nice. not yeah, too yeah. far from you. Yeah, yeah. Right okay. on. Yep, yep. And I'm uh, phoning in from Missoula, Montana. Nice. So yeah, a little bit of a little bit of snow today, but it's super nice. Mm -hmm. oh, jealous. Cool. Right. And I'm yeah. I'm about uh, 20 minutes south of Burlington, Vermont. Oh, nice. Nice. A little town called Heinsburg. Cool. I'm in uh, Central Jersey, as you can tell. I have a Jersey accent, right? So yeah. <laughs> Jersey strong, nice. Noel. Jersey strong, man. Right. Hey, I, I lived there for a few years and uh it, quite honestly, every picture that I'm showing pretty much is from your neck of the woods. So mm -hmm. well, a little bit north. So you might recognize that I'm and I'd like to apologize for that ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> and north the, Jersey being as scenic as it is. Yeah. I think we're just about ready to go. So, Kevin, where where are you phoning in from? Uh, near near Asheville, North Carolina. Nice. Love that town. The yep. only West Coaster. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Nice. Well, let's uh, let's get this show on the road, shall we, you guys? Yeah. All, think, right? All right. Um. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Cooper from National Parks at Night, and welcome to Five Photographers, Five Stories. Our kickoff event for the uh, 2023 Night Photo Summit. Uh, we're all super excited about that. Um, for those of you that have uh, already registered, thanks. Awesome. Great. We're really looking forward to seeing you next weekend. Um, for those of y'all that are attending free today, welcome as well. Um, hope you get a nice little little taste of what, uh, what the summit's going to be all about. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us for that uh, grand event next week. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll start with a little housekeeping here. Uh, just make sure we're all on the same ground here or the same uh, same page. So number one, everybody's video is off in the audience. Um, so, you know, you're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to hear you. Um, if you want to chat with one another, um, and I see Jay is, says the chat turned off, the chat is actually on right now. So no, if y'all want, just go and find your chat. It's at the lower uh, portion of the screen. 
pop it up. You can chat to all your friends uh, 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 throughout the room here. Um, but if you've got a question, once we get rolling, if you've got a question for uh, the instructors, do not use the chat because we're probably not going to see that. So what we would rather have you do is um, go into the Q&A and type your question in there. And then we'll be able to see it and pass it on to uh, to, to the speaker at the moment, okay? So use the Q&A for questions, not, not the chat. Um, let's see. Oh, also, really cool thing. If you uh, look down at the bottom of the screen, um, you've got something that's called CC, closed captions. And if you all want to click on that, you can do so. And um, what you'll see is actually... Uh, closed captioning while the while the speaker is speaking. But the really cool thing is that if you click on that little uh, arrow, that little up arrow next to the CC, uh, you're going to see view live transcript or view rather view full transcript. And what you can do is you can actually go back and see everything that's been said. So if you miss something, um, you're able to uh, to to, uh, to to view it in that way. Um, Got to tell you, I'm really excited about this event tonight. I'm really excited to see these folks work. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it as well. Um, and I'm super excited about the Night Photo Summit next weekend. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Lance Kymig, one of our partners from National Parks at Night, and uh, let him introduce our, our wonderful uh, photographer speakers tonight. And uh, Lance, you ready, buddy? All right. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. And... Uh, I was looking for the closed captioning option there. And right. on my screen, because the Zoom window is collapsed a little bit, there's a more tab with three little buttons. Wow. So if you're not seeing CC or, or captions, click on the more and that'll pop up there. So um, yeah, so thanks for that introduction, Tim. I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about the summit too. This is, uh, it's such a, a rush of preparation to get to this point where we're you know, we're about to launch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's it just like this massive push of energy for a good solid month or more before we start. And then everything it just all comes crashing in. And it's just such an amazing event and really, uh, really cool to get so many different perspectives and so many different people all bringing their 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 skills and their energy to the summit. So speaking of that, I'm going to stop talking and I'd like to introduce our speakers tonight. We're going to start with with Kevin, Kevin Adams, um, and I'd, I'd been aware of Kevin's work for a long time before we actually first met in 2019. He invited uh, Chris Nicholson and I to speak at his Digital After Dark conference in North Carolina, which he produces every couple of years. Um, I, I'm, it may be the last one was 2019 because of COVID, but I hope he brings it back again. Seems like a long time to go without that, Kevin. So. Hope we're going to have another one. But uh, Ke Kevin is intensely creative. He's really funny. He's very kind, a naturalist, and a great photographer. He's known mostly for his photography of waterfalls and fireflies, uh, the latter of which he has in common with one of our other guests this, be this evening, which you'll, you'll hear about in a few minutes. Kevin is the author of ten, and photographer of 10 books and his latest book, 365 Nights, A Year-Long Immersion in Night Photography is scheduled for release soon. So Kevin lives in Waynesboro, North Carolina and uh, he loves groundhogs. Nope, no, he does love groundhogs. He loves cats and he hates groundhogs. I messed that one up. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Lance. Yeah, the the it's my wife that doesn't like the groundhogs because they eat all of her plants. That's the the problem with them. But hey, thank you guys for inviting me here, and thank you everyone uh, who is watching me here. I really appreciate that. Um, so, um, Lance, is my image showing to everybody now? Because all I see is my ugly mug shot. Uh, if you <laughs> if you're ready, I'll bring it up. Let's bring it up. Yeah. Yeah, they don't need to be looking at me anymore. <clears throat> yeah, here we go. How about that? So, um, hey, I was um, I was checking out some of the work from the other presenters. Oh, my gosh. Cool stuff. And uh, Susan and Katrina in particular stood out to me because they've got some very creative 
image is showing light painting that um, that looks like fire and resembles fire. And some of it does have, I think there's some sparklers going on in there, but I believe uh, most of it is done with just creative light painting techniques. I'm not that smart. Um, I use real fire and that has gotten me in trouble at times. When I was 11 years old, I set fire to the woods behind our house and the fire department had to come out and put it out. When I was 21 years old, I set fire to the woods behind our house and the fire department had to come out and put it out. So I've been playing with fire for a long time. And for this particular image, I wasn't smart enough to use the right kind of smoke bombs either. Um, you can get smoke bombs. That's what the smoke is here, uh, uh, or the smoky look stuff is actually from smoke bombs. You can get smoke bombs that uh, have a, of a cool smoke. They don't get too hot and the smoke is not toxic. Um, I wasn't that smart with this. I, I used the regular stuff that really set things on fire and all of that. But the idea here was this is one of the shots that I made for my um, 365 nights project where I photographed a new night photo every night. I didn't have the luxury. Most of the time I'm shooting by myself. And so if there's a person in the scene, it's me, it's a selfie. And as you can tell, I'm not the best for selfies. So I was very happy when I had friends come over to my house to spend a few days. And so I took advantage of that so I could photograph them. And this is one of the shots that I made for that. This is Joanne. And I dressed her in one of Patricia's, my wife's dresses and put her out there. And I'll explain how we did all this. Um, but one of the things that I did for the night project was when I would do something like this, I like to come up with some kind of cool caption when I would post it on Instagram and on. This is the caption that I did for this one. Uh, introducing Queen Joanna Fireborn of the House Motley Crew. That's what we called our little get together, Motley Crew. The seventh other name, Queen of the Bushwhackers, the Crab Boil, and the Cray Man, Lady of the Smoke Bombs and Protector of Patricia's Dress, Lady of Speedlight, Queen of Overexposure, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Burnt Spot, the Barely Unburnt, Breaker of Chain Letters, and Mother of Lizards. Thank you very much, Joanne, for doing this. So here's the setup for this. Um, I did not ask Joanne to stand in a ring of fire. Let me just tell you that up front, okay? I didn't ask her to do that. I put her there, and then I set that ring on fire without her knowing it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I didn't do that. So. The first thing that I did was I got a shot for the sky. I wanted to do this during twilight. That was very important because I wanted that illumination from the sky to match the intensity of the lighting, the light painting and the firelight that I was doing. So when the sky got just right, I took a photo just of the sky with nothing else in the scene. And then I take Joanne out and I put her there. You have her raise her hands. I lit four smoke bombs all around her. Now, one of the problems that I had, well, and this is a problem you have at any time with smoke bombs, if the wind's blowing, it, it blows all over the place. And the smoke bombs that I were using, the smoke didn't last very long, unlike the ones that you can get that they use for movies and things. Um, so it, that was a problem. And it's one of the reasons why I set four of them out to make sure we got enough. Standing in front of Joanne had another buddy who had a camera flash. And he was firing that manually. We'd lit, light the smoke bombs. And then when the smoke got good, he would fire the flash. And the idea was the flash is going to illuminate that smoke. These are orange smoke bombs, by the way. It's going to illuminate that smoke. And that worked okay, except for the wind part. So it illuminated well on her left-hand side. It didn't do so much on her right-hand side. So what I ended up having to do at the end in post-processing was I had to duplicate part of the smoke that's on the left-hand side and put it over on the right-hand side to get the full effect. The whiteness right around her is because that was totally blown out from the flash, but that's okay. I like that effect. I wanted that because it makes her stand out more, I feel like. Um, so we did two runs of that before the smoke just got us. Um, but I got the shots that I needed for that. So there's a shot for the sky. And then we did a couple of shots for, uh, or a couple of runs with the smoke bombs to get the smoke bomb stuff. And with that, I took several shots throughout. So he's firing that flash probably three or four times 
uh, with each lighting of those smoke bombs. Now, Joanne moves out of the way at that point, and then I light the fire ring. And I started out with uh, lamp oil. Uh, I tell you, if you want to use real fire for your photography, first of all, don't burn down the woods behind your house, okay? That's not a good thing. But for something like this, so I put the lamp oil out, and that's a good thing to use because it doesn't explode when you light it, and I have had that problem. But we won't go there. Um, and, and it burns for quite a while, too, so it works really well. So I poured lamp oil in a circle. Now the camera stays set up on the tripod in the same position, right? Pour the lamp oil out and I light it, but it just didn't create enough, didn't put up those flames like I wanted it to. So I went up to the barn and I got the gas can and I poured out a bunch of gas in a circle around there. Let me tell you, that gave me the effect I wanted, okay? It also, also left that great grass burnt spot that is still, this was in August of 21, that burnt spot is still in our front yard and Patricia is not very happy with me at all. So I got a shot with the fire. Now I took that shot with the fire, I took the shot with the smoke bombs and the shot with the uh, twilight sky. I loaded them all into Photoshop, changed the blend mode to lighten and voila, I've got my shot. And the only other thing I had to do is as, as I said, is I had to clone part of that smoke from the left-hand side over to the right to sort of fill that in and make it work. That was it. Did I stay within 10 minutes? <laughs> cool. That's All great. Right. That's awesome. Cool, Kevin. I, I seem to remember there being some fire involved at the uh, Digital After Dark program that uh, Chris and I were there Man, for, I, too. I just, I don't know. I just like playing with fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for for that illuminating story. <laughs> oh, well, nice, yep. Lance. <laughs> did that set, set you on fire, huh? <laughs> you did indeed. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank really you, Kevin. Cool. Really cool. All right. Um, next up is Susan Magnano. And uh, I, I first met Susan a few years ago, uh, quite a number of years ago now, at one of the photography conferences in New York. Um, she introduced, was introduced to me by Chris Nicholson, one of our, our partners at National Parks at Night. And then we uh, we crossed paths again at, at Death Valley. And I was I was struck immediately by Susan's energy, her enthusiasm and mm -hmm. her optimism. She She's just one of one of the most the brightest speaking of illumination, one of the brightest people I know. So um, <laughs> she's she's a photographer, <laughs> an explorer, um, and an educator. And she, she chases the light any time of day or night. And um, I'll say that she's uh, she's been known to have workshop students and at least one co-instructor begging her to let them get some sleep on her <laughs> workshops. <laughs> she just doesn't stop. We She's do all-nighters, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> and then go up for the all day, too. <laughs> and the day, too, yes. <laughs> but Susan's known mostly for her light painting and her luminescent portrait series, uh, one of which she'll be talking about tonight, blends her love of night photography and, port and her passion for portraiture. Her company is Photo Tour, uh, Photo Tour Adventures, and they lead photo tours and workshops all over the world. So thank you very much. Um, you ready for me to pop your image up? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, I am so honored to be here with you guys and especially such a great team we got here. Kevin, unfortunately, I don't have a name as slick as yours. <laughs> I wish I did. I don't think it's possible to beat that name, um, but uh, I'm, I'm honored to be talking with you guys today. So uh, we could pop up my picture. Great. So this is the end result of... Um, a couple different scenes. So what I'd like to do is kind of show you the building of it. So my favorite thing to do is to light paint. I like to do low level lighting and mix it with some light design in front of the camera and incorporate people as you can see. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump right to sharing my screen. So perfect, great. Now let's go to Lightroom. Sharing, great. So tell me if you guys can see this okay? Good. 
So we're going to jump right in. The first thing I do when I'm going to do any photo is kind of get the ambient light shot. So I wanted to expose for the sky here. And we had all our cameras set up. I think someone was using a flashlight, but none of that really mattered. I was just really exposing for the sky and to kind of get that base level shot. First thing I do, ambient. Then I decided I wanted to add some low level light. And low level light painting is different than light painting because it is what it is in the name, low level. So what I used was a Luxley Fiddle. I have one right here. These lights are so awesome. And we decided to make it red to do some color contrast with the sky. And what we did was we put it inside this cool church. Uh, this church is at Nelson Ghost Town right outside Las Vegas. And it is one of my favorite places to do light painting because there's so many cool features at this location. There's crashed airplanes and um, and ca old cars. And I'm doing two workshops there this year, one this March and one in November. And it is just so much fun. You can really be there all night. So we chose this location because we wanted to tell a story around it. And that's what I like to do with my pictures. I don't just take what's in front of me. I design it. I make a story. So first we decided let's put some light inside the church to give it some life. And we chose red because we thought it was some good color contrast with the sky. And I had the Lexi Fiddle at about 2% brightness because it's going to be on for the duration of the scene. And the reason why I do this is so I can actually free myself to do some really cool light painting and some light designing. So it just stays on the whole time. You set it and you forget it. Perfect. So then we decided we have a cool church. What can we add to it? And I said, well, we can add some lovers. So we had a couple with us and uh, they agreed to do some posing. So we push, positioned them in the doorway of the church and I used a tube. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with light painting, but there's um, the genius, Eric Pere. He came up with this tube light painting where you use a plastic tube like one of these. And it's basically a hollow plastic tube and you stick a flashlight in it and you're able to create this amazing kind of design. And um, I learned that technique from Eric and now I incorporate it in a lot of my pictures. What I used here was a white tube with a piece of green tape on the edge of it. And I just did a circle, simple circle behind them. And I thought, okay, that was neat, but I think I can build on this photo. So then I decided, let's make the church blue. You know, let's like switch it up because I actually had a red tube and I thought what goes better with blue and uh, blue is red. So we could use some color contrast there. So what we did was we moved the couple outside of the church. We put them closer to these really cool cactuses. Um, so the red light from the tube now would spill onto the cactuses. And then we did something really cool. So I used one of these speed lights like so. And if you turn it on, uh, there's a little button that turns red. And all I did was I powered the flash on manual mode. I put it on manual mode and I made it the lowest power, like one, 128th power. And I used this little test button and I flash it back towards the camera. And I did that to create this kind of lightning bug effect. And we kind of ran around them, flashing them from behind. And a trick when you're doing this is not to overpower it. If I had this on a brighter setting, it would just look like blown out blotches. So it's really important to make it a dimmer setting so you're not blinding back the camera. We put the couple in that nice position. And this was basically, I think, a 30 second exposure. I did have a team of people with me. This is last year. Uh, I worked with b &H to create this picture. I think someone else flashed them and I did the circle. So it's always nice to have people around to help you and be a part of the picture because this is so interactive and fun. Um, thinking of anything else, I think that kind of sums up this picture. Uh, it was 30 seconds. The reason why you don't see me is because I always move throughout the picture. So I did the circle behind them. And then I moved out of frame. So if I stood in the same spot, you actually might see me with the person flashing the flashlight towards the camera. But because I moved out of frame, um, you didn't see me. And for the person who flashed the camera, flashed the uh, flash back at the camera, you don't see them because there's no light hitting them. So a lot of people ask. Also, I'm part ninja. That's why you don't see me. And it also helps if you wear black clothing. So then you blend in more with the black, ba black background and the darkness. As a little bonus, um, I do have another version of this picture I wanted to share. So this is a different night, but because you guys are all night lovers, uh, to make more interesting 
um, star trail pictures, I think light painting is always awesome. And I don't do many composites, but this is a composite. So I did a 30 minute exposure of the sky and then I did the foreground with some light painting. So just to see how, if you guys wanna do some cool star trails, incorporate some light painting with it. Does anyone have any questions? We'll we'll take those at the end if, if okay. we can. Great. Oh. Well, thank you. All right. So um, would you stop your share? Yeah. Oh, let me do that actually. Thank you. Cool. All right. So thank thank you, Susan. Uh, super cool. I, I've yet to get to Nelson myself. It's uh, on on the list though. Such a seeing so many cool images from yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. All right. Well, um, next up is Pete Mowney. Um, It's not very often that I meet somebody who's been photographing at night as long as I have. And it's even more unusual to find someone who's been photographing at night longer than I have. And, and I think Pete <laughs> is that person. Um, so Pete melded his nocturnal tendencies and photography as a teenager in the early 80s and has been at it ever since. Um, we've, we've only just... We didn't have to go down the date road, though, right? <laughs> oh. ah, well, anyway, um, we've only just met here in the, in the context of the Night Photo Summit, uh, but I can tell that you are a curious and industrious, and a, and a gentle soul. So I'm, uh, we're we're all very happy to have you here, and uh, I'm happy and, to and be here. Summit. All right, yeah. Um, so. Two, two of Pete's long-term projects, um, one is photographing plane trails, and that's something that most of us night photographers do everything we can to possibly avoid. And, and the other is fireflies, like Kevin. So, bo both of these projects really present stunning visuals, but from what I've seen of your work, Pete, you don't stop at just the visual. You're, you're studying the way things work in the universe, whether it whether it be organic or natural or man-made, that's that seems to be something that carries through from both the Firefly project and and the uh, plane trails that you're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and lastly, I wanted to mention that uh, back in August, uh, NPR did a piece on your Firefly work, and uh, we're going to paste that a link to that on the NPR website into the chat so everybody can go and, and check that out. It, there's just a, like a two or three minute uh, audio bit, but there's a much longer arti article on the NPR website. So please take a look and, and check that out when you can. Um, in the meantime, let's um, let's talk about what we're, what we're here for tonight. And I'm going to shut up and turn off my video. And are you ready for your image to come up? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I guess. Um... I'll say before I put this up, you know, I, I I didn't have to think for very long about which which image I was going to show. Um, mostly because, it, well, this isn't maybe the best image I've ever made. I, I can think of quite a few that are that I would put above it. Um, but it, I never in forty years of intentional image making and a lifetime of image gathering um never have i learned so much from one photograph and one experience and even though i made it in 2017 i'm i'm sort of still learning um some of these same lessons or some different lessons new lessons uh from the same picture um and uh so yeah i think with that little intro i think we can uh throw that picture up but i you know i do want to give a, a bit of a trigger warning for the for the astrophotographers out there um, who don't like the airplanes because well that's that's sort of my whole thing right um, I uh, yeah, oddly enough it actually all started I was in um, I mean I've always loved systems my entire life I love systems electronics things that you can build things that you can take apart um, logistics uh, routes. Um, you know, highways, all these kinds of things. And there was a period of time, I moved around a lot when I was growing up, and um, I went to high school briefly in New Jersey. 
and there are these cliffs outside of our town and we could go up and um see sort of the entirety of of sort of the the north jersey um sort of meadowlands area giant stadium all that kind of stuff and one of the things that i would do for hours on end was watch the air traffic at newark airport um circling circling around the airport and i you know I just I felt almost like I could visualize it, but with the analog equipment available at the time, there's really nothing I could do, especially as, you know, a broke 15 year old high school student. Um, so it, it kind of went into the back of my head and I just went on. I'm a nocturnal person. I just naturally uh, like to work at night. I feel very comfortable at night. And uh, at a certain point, I started photographing fireflies, and I, I distinctly remember this sort of transition point where I, I was about a year into photographing the fireflies. It's like, you know, damn it, I keep getting really annoyed with these airplanes in the pictures. And I was like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> Um, and it all sort of flashed back to me, and um, it changed a few things. Number one, I accepted the airplanes as compositional elements um, of, of our interaction with the natural world in the Firefly images, um, but then started to uh, try to think about how I could utilize this technique um, that digital photography had allowed. It's the same technique a lot of people use, image blending. It's, um, um, it's pretty straightforward. And I figured that I could use this to um, um, to actually visualize some of these some of these patterns that I've that I've always seen happen in real time. But you know, real time is an accumulative experience like this. It's very transitional. So I had been working on the fireflies for a while. I had tried to do a photograph of uh, of Newark. It failed miserably. I left the autofocus on. I didn't really know what I was doing. I had never really done image stacking before. Complete failure. I went, I did one in Boston that was pretty cool. And then I was like, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to do. It, it wasn't a great time in my life. And there's, you know, family drama and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And it was right around Christmas. And I drive all the way to JFK from the mid Hudson Valley, three hours, terrible. I found a terrible location. Then I couldn't get closer because there was a bridge close and it's quicker to go to New Jersey. So I went to Newark airport and I had a couple spots. So I was like, okay, I've been watching these plane apps and watching the air traffic patterns for months in anticipation of this. And I was like, okay, I think I have a couple spots uh, pretty good. And I, I went to this one. And honestly, it was, you know, I'll, I'll be straight up. It was trespassing. Um, you know, uh, I don't think I could do it right now. Um, it was a, an electrical substation adjacent to the um, uh, uh, New Jersey Turnpike. And I should also add, it was uh, gusts up to uh, 40 this night. It was 25 degrees and it was wicked cold. It was probably the closest I've ever gotten to hypothermia was making this. Um, I learned a lot about how to dress <laughs> later. And... Um, I was using two cameras at the time. I did um, two different setups and basically just hung out for an hour and a half and hoped that the state police wouldn't show up and chase me out, um, which, you know, has certainly happened uh, different times when I'm working uh, along the turnpike. And, um, you know, I get here and, and, and finally, okay, uh, you know, I, I, I get to this location. I, I'm going back up a little bit. I, I, you know, I have it all planned out in my head. I'm going to jump out. I'm going to build the cameras. I go running around my car. I start to trip over something. Just avoid it. Hit a patch of ice. Fall flat on my butt. Um, head, ribs, everything. Right down in the dust. Frozen dust. New Jersey landfill zone. Um, and you know, I, I was, I kind of staggered up and I looked over and I, I actually tripped over a frozen and dead duck of all the possible things. Um, it was otherwise intact, but, but sitting there frozen and dead. And, and I'm like, oh, this is, this is inauspicious. Um, but I go ahead, make the pictures. 
hang out for an hour and a half, freeze. Um, don't want to hang out at the car because I don't want the state police to come. Anyway, I get to the cameras. I check them. The first camera, I can tell instantly that something was wrong. I had either not locked down the tripod or I had left the image stabilization on the frames weren't aligning. Um, and I was like, Ugh. <laughs> I went to the second camera and my plan shot had been ruined by the moon coming all the way into the frame. Um, so I had uh, anticipated that uh, incorrectly. And so it was just a crappy night. It was a crappy time in my life. It was a crappy night. It's like, oh, I screwed everything up. I drove home. I was dejected. It took two and a half hours to get home. I was frozen. I couldn't feel my feet, my hands for an hour. Finally get home, I get some sleep. I wake up the next day, start processing images because I got to at least know because I have to at least see if there's any potential here for this to be a project that could possibly work. And I processed the first one, my A camera, and it was, you know, as expected, as terrible. And if I didn't value my sanity, I could have aligned, um, you know, the four or 500 images that were stacked uh, one by one, but I, I wasn't going to do that. And so I was like, okay, the other one's a total loser, but I'm going to process it anyway and see what happens. And so I do some basic raw processing. I stack them all. And, you know, if you ever, if you came from analog photography, there's a magic that analog photography has that digital just doesn't have. Watching a print come up uh, in the darkroom is just an amazing experience. It's magic. And there's not much of that in digital, uh, except, you know, of course, at night, as evidenced by all my um, fantastic co-presenters. Um, but this whole blending mode thing and being able to do these long exposures was about as close as I've come to that. Cause there's that one moment, the last second where you finally click the button and everything pops into existence. And when that happened for this picture, it just, it took my breath away. I thought I'd completely screwed it up, but instead it was something that it was, it was almost singing to me. Um, it was, it was musical. I could smell it. I could feel it. The moon far from being like this flared out disaster had actually become kind of an interesting element in the frame. And, um, it's, it's things like this. It's going out every night. Uh, one of the most wonderful things about working at night is there's so little that you can control, and new things happen all the time and failure happens all the time and failure ends up being a strength more than a liability because it just builds you stronger and stronger. Um, and, you know, I mean, one of the things in my case is, is failure is inherent because I generally don't manipulate the environment that I'm in. I take it as it is. I don't adjust any of the plane trails. I don't. Um, I don't do any of that. It's, it is what it is, warts and all. The only thing I take out is if um, cars are, are flaring, car headlights are flaring out the frame. Um, and anyway, it's just, it's a picture. It's kind of a wild picture. It, it means a lot to me personally. It taught me a lot about failure. It taught me a lot about the value of failure um and it taught me a lot about perseverance and um and that pain is temporary <laughs> until it's frostbite and then it's not funny anymore um and i think um i think i might i don't know how far i've gone i have absolutely no conception i could talk about this for two days um, so have I gone anywhere close to, um, you know, a, a reasonable limit on this? Um, you're about there, but, uh, we're all enjoying. Oh, great. Uh, okay. I've been trying to, time. I've been trying to talk quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, pl please um, go and, on a little bit more. Cause it, and it's... so, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, you know, it's what's fascinating to me, quite honestly, is, you know, you go to a part of the world, like the tri-state area of New York. And there's so many large active airports and there's so many large, uh, and so many small active airports. And not only that, you have all this uh, sort of low level air traffic that's sort of ever present and on top of everything. 
Um, but then it's also a crossroads for global traffic. So, you know, the UPS flights from Munich to Lexington are going by up at 40,000 feet and 747s. You know, half of the the aircraft in this photograph are smaller aircraft doing short runs, maybe going down to Charlotte. Um, a lot of them going to DC. All the ones that you see heading off on the right hand side of the screen, those are all the aircraft heading south. So I'm looking uh, more or less south here. It's I'm a little off. I guess it's closer to west. But those aircraft are all ultimately going to be going south. There's a whole bunch of other ones. If you look on the on the left, you see that goes straight and goes straight up. Those are the ones going north. Those are mostly European flights um, or flights to Albany, um, which is a little bit less romantic. Um, and so when I finally had this picture and finally could see the multitudes um, of, of sources, it, it just became an obsession um uh for uh, for me to just go out there and try and map these map these spaces so i've done a little bit of traveling i've gone to denver uh which has obviously a pretty huge airport um and a lot of open space around it uh i've done all the tri-state um uh airports a bunch boston i've done uh, a couple places in you know uh, massachusetts connecticut area and uh, but for some reason that I'm still not entirely certain about when the pandemic happened, um, so starting in um, uh, 2020, at the, in January 2020, I shifted over to um, do all um, Newark Airport. Um, my window for photography is roughly October to the beginning of March. I pretty much only go out on clear nights, so that's really pretty limiting. Um, but I feel like um, I feel like I've sort of stumbled into this project of just mapping the airspace around uh, Newark Airport at this point. And I just have hundreds of images, not all um, as as uh, as maybe, um exciting <laughs> is this one there's the um uh, doing this kind of work the reject rate is very high um higher than i'd like to think um but uh but it's just it's become a really sort of interesting obsessive uh process for me and now i just spend nights driving around the middle of the winter with my car windows down my head out the window looking looking for airplanes, trying to match them up to the apps. And then, you know, am I getting to the right place at the right time? And then they change the air traffic. So it's just a huge, fascinating puzzle uh, to me. And um, I can't get enough of it. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think, I think I'm going to leave it there for right now. Awesome. How does that sound? That's just just fascinating. Right. Really, your your approach is just so interesting, and the way you're thinking about these things, and and also, uh, I think a lot of people probably appreciate talking about learning from failures. Oh, it's it's essential. I mean, um, I you know, failing at life is one thing. <laughs> we don't we don't necessarily want to do that, but one of the greatest things about art is that art is one of the 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 places that um failure is is actually if you if you think about it at least the way i do failure is just data right it's um it it preps you for the next time it um it it makes you better and I just, I find it for me, at least to be an essential uh, part of the process. There are so many good photographs that I've made that came out of me being unaccepting sort of of the failure of initial results or learning from the initial failures and, and going back and, and doing it again. As you can imagine, doing things like this 
quote unquote again is a little bit difficult. I have no control over my subject matter. <laughs> sure. Um, but do you, yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you mind if I throw a couple of quick questions at you? Absolutely. Go right ahead. From, from the audience. Um, yeah, yeah. Chris, Chris is asking um, uh, more of a technical question. Do sure. you use uh, noise reduction in your post processing? None. None. Okay. Cool. And um, uh, Josh is asking, how long are the individual exposures in this? Oh, um, you know, that varies. Um, it varies from uh, from place to place. Obviously, the uh, skies here are very bright. So I'm shooting at a sort of abnormally low uh, sensitivity. I, I usually shoot around 400. Um, and I close down to five, six or so. Um, and the exposures range anywhere from... I mean, one of the things I have to keep in mind is that each exposure is a, a chunk of data that I have to store and manipulate. So um, I try not to keep the exposure shorter than um, eight seconds. I prefer there's sort of a sweet spot around 13 seconds, if I can get around there, that gives me a lot of time with relatively little data usage. But when the moon is out, the exposures have to be shorter. I imagine these uh, here that made up the stack were probably eight seconds, I'm guessing. Uh, um, that's a lot of frames. Oh, yeah, it's hundreds, hundreds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, one more. Um, yeah. And Reem, Reem wants to know, when you approach these types of fixtures now, are, are you still surprised by the patterns that emerge? Um, and do you use uh, an app to predict flight patterns? Um, both. Uh, the, answer, <laughs> the answer is yes to both. Um, seeing them flattened on the, on the app is, uh, I mean, it's one thing. You can see the curve. You can get an idea for where um, a given pattern is going to take a turn. But when you actually see it in more three-dimensional space in person, you realize that it's it's much more sort of complex. And um, and and the photographs give you a bit of that. Um, they give you a bit of the the sense that the aircraft are at different altitudes and and things like that. Um, and they wobble around a lot for things that are flown by computers. Yeah, I'm always kind of fascinated by that. But I guess it's really windy up there also. And and oddly, I I don't like to fly. <laughs> And for some reason, when I started this project, I was like, oh, this is partly therapeutic. You know, this is um, this is going to help me become more comfortable with flying. I can't say it's done that. Uh, but, and, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question in, in some way. Yeah, yeah, I think so. One, one more that I, I just thought of. Um, have mm -hmm. you considered uh, doing a project of photographing the uh, Starlink satellites or, or satellites as well as planes? I have. I've done a few things with satellites, and um, I'm still trying to figure out how to work on that. Um, I'm also uh, concurrently for the past four years, I've I'm still in sort of an experimental phase of working with high altitude uh, uh, aircraft traffic. So you know when they're when they're uh, at full altitude in the 30s and 40s thousands feet. Um, and that's kind of a similar problem to the uh, um, to the satellites in, in terms of as a technical thing. Um, and so I'm I'm in the process of working out technically how I would want to do that. But I have done a few things with satellites, but nothing specifically with Starlink. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a few with uh, the International Space Station. Um, and always, I, I completely welcome each and every single one of them as a random event. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I just love random events. So there you go. All right. Well, thank you so yeah. much. Um, thank you. You thank have you. Uh, you have wet our appetites for your presentation next weekend. And uh, we're <laughs> glad to have you here. So thank you. Well, I mean, everybody is. I mean, I'm just I'm having a blast here listening to how everybody else do it. I live in kind of a bubble. So, you know, this is kind of fun for me. Cool. It's like I'm getting out.
<laughs> All right. Well, thank All you right. very much. I'm going to step yep. back and, you know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, we're, we're over the hump. We've got two more speakers to go, uh, talking about two more incredible images. And next up is Noel Thomas. Um, Noel specializes in the production of astro landscape photography and nature time-lapse film shot around the world. His work's been widely published and his first astro time-lapse film, uh, and this is not, we're not talking your typical 30 second time-lapse film, but hour long, uh, called Starscapes One is now playing on United Airlines flights. The second film, Starscapes Two, is playing on the Nature Relaxation Films YouTube channel. Uh, tonight he's going to be talking about the making of a still image from from one of these films, and we'll also see a selection of or a section of of one of those time lapses. So um, looking forward to that for sure. Noel has also been teaching astro workshops for the last three years or so. He lives in New Jersey, um, has a degree in, a, or multiple degrees in applied mathematics from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And uh, no, we, we've, we've only just met here for the purpose of, of tonight and the summit going forward, but um, look forward to getting to know you better and, and seeing more of your work. So th thank you. And uh, let me know whenever you're ready. Uh, just give me a thumbs up and I'll pop your image up there. I'm ready. Thank you, Lance. Appreciate it. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for the opportunity here t this evening to talk about uh, one of my projects. As Lance said, I focus on astro time lapse photography, and so this is a still image from a time lapse that I had done up in Acadia National Park in Maine late this past summer, and what I usually do is uh, I, I'm very spontaneous with the work that I do, I often study the weather quite a bit, as any astrophotographer does, and I only go on trips when I'm 90 plus percent sure that the weather is going to be working. Um, and I'll often leave on a moment's notice, as long as it fits into my schedule to just jump on a plane and go somewhere to get a shot that night. Um, and that's what I did for this. I, I've been watching Acadia and I was waiting to shoot this location. The interesting thing was I had never actually been to this area before. This is called Raven's Nest, um, which is in Acadia National Park. And it's in a remote, more remote area of Acadia, a uh, different peninsula called Skudik. And I had been wanting to visit this for a few years. Uh, this alignment only occurs towards the later summer and the weather there is often cloudy. So I've been watching the clouds and also using photo pills to sort of gauge the alignment and when it might work, but I had never actually been there. So when I went up there, it was a late evening um, flight and then driving out there. And unfortunately I was behind schedule and wound up getting there quite late, right at right after sunset happened. So I was a little nervous and worried because I, I didn't have the, enough time as I had wanted to scope out the area, find this place and plan the shot. So I was working quickly. And first thing I realized after getting there was that this place does not have any marker on the road to tell you where, where Raven's Nest is. Um, so in fact, the place that's on the map, on Google Maps, where it tells you this place is, is not accurate. Um, it's sort of um, maybe a quarter, half a mile off. So uh, I asked some people, I, hikers I had seen, and finally I figured out where it was. And it's on the edge of a very dangerous cliff. So just to warn you, this isn't the kind of place I would go you know, to do your first um, time lapse or night trip, I would definitely go scope it out during the day. You want to check it thoroughly and make sure you're very familiar with the landscape um, and the terrain uh, and also the incline when you're going down. It's very steep. So um, this is actually the time lapse that I had, uh, created um, overall. And you can see the Milky Way core region going across the night sky. The tide is starting to go out during this hour and the bioluminescence that occurred, you can see in the lower right there, actually we had just passed it, uh, that, that white um, choppy area with the waves is, was flashing blue in the beginning. Uh, and I knew there, were, there was bioluminescence there, but I wasn't sure if I was going to capture it. And it's interesting, the bioluminescence occurred earlier in the night while the tide was go starting um, to go out just after it had come in. So you could see the blue flashes there and that's pretty consistent with what i've heard 
uh, with other photographers capturing the bioluminescence. It occurs when there's more waves, uh, more breaking in the water, which activates the phytoplankton and causes them to light up as a defensive mechanism. So this was, I wasn't sure when I was there if I was capturing it. In fact, what I do with my time lapses is I often leave the camera out um, most of the night for a few hours and then come back. And this definitely wasn't the kind of place I would be hanging out while running the time lapse. Like I said, it's on the edge of a cliff. There's not much room to move around. Uh, so I had gone back to my car up on the road. When capturing these time lapses, what I'm basically doing, and I'll talk more about this at the conference uh, in a week during my session, I'm taking long exposure uh, photographs and then I'm pulling them all together in, into a video. And so that you can then see the passage of time and what happens. This is about over a three to four hour period where you can see the Milky Way core going across the sky. And it was a bonus, a, a nice one that the clouds actually came in at the end. I wasn't expecting that during the night, but it just adds another element um, of, uh, of activity. And that's what I always suggest when doing time lapses is you wanna do a time lapse of something that has at least two, maybe three, elements of motion at most. And here I have three. I have the sky with the Milky Way, the water going out, and the clouds. And you know, if you can get at least two or three, that really makes a great visually uh, stimulating time lapse. What was really challenging about this too is when I had first gotten there and was setting up, uh, unfortunately, I lost my glasses. I decided to go and do a little bit more exploration. So if you see the left side of this photo where the cliff is there with the with the trees. I had actually gone out to that area as it was getting dark just to make sure I was in the right spot. And as I did, I walked into this huge spider web that really startled me. And as a reaction, I threw up my hands and threw my glasses off, which it took me about 15 minutes to find. And I was getting quite worried because I couldn't see and I was on the ground with my phone flashlight for 10 minutes <laughs> trying to find them, hoping that they, they were found, um, which I eventually did find them. And I was so relieved um, and the night went pretty smoothly from there. So this was a really exciting shot. Uh, I definitely think that, you know, like I said, um, you definitely want to make sure that a lot of things align. You have to have the planning with the alignment using photo pills or another app. You need to have your settings. And the other thing I was lucky with is there weren't really any other photographers there that night with flashing lights because when lights flash, in the foreground that can uh, ruin a time lapse and make it more challenging to post process. And last but not least, the last challenge from this experience was later that night when I was on the other end of the park after this, I accidentally deleted the sequence uh, in my camera when I was futzing around and I thought it was gone, but I learned about a software that is able to retrieve lost data on SD cards. So if you ever do that, there is software out there that can recover these things. Um, and the software that I used found photos that I had captured about three uh, sessions before after I had already d formatted a few times. So it's kind of amazing what the software, forensic software can do these days to recover um, information that was formatted. So hope you enjoyed this. And like I said, I'll be talking more about Astro Time Lapse uh, at my session in a week, which I'm really excited about. And I'd be happy to take any questions that folks might have. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. And man, what a what an adventure or almost a misadventure um, uh, must have been just gut wrenching to think you'd lost it all. Um, it was. <laughs> let's see. Uh, Jay's got a question for you. Um, is it taken with an Astro modified camera? Yes, this was taken with an Astro modified camera. And I have to say, I don't think that the Astro modification did much to enhance the quality of this time lapse, mainly because this was a wide, ultra wide angle shot at 14 millimeters. And so everything is really zoomed out. Uh, and so, but yeah, I, I do, I think if you go from 24 or higher up to 50, you get to see more detail and, and the Astro modification will bring out more of the H alpha in the core. Right, right, cool. Um, and uh, I know you're using Lightroom Time Lapse. Is that your primary software? Or do you work with other other uh, software as well? That's um, uh, Vanessa's asking that one. 
Yes, hi Vanessa. Yes, I use LR time lapse as well as Lightroom. Light, LR time lapse works in conjunction with Lightroom, uh, and then I also sometimes use After Effects. And what uh, what necessitates going from LR time lapse into After Effects, or yeah, is this totally different stuff? After Effects has some powerful um, uh, cleanup tools that you can use when you're doing your time lapses. So, for example removing noise, even birds, uh, flashes of light, all that can be done in After Effects quite effectively. All right, well, we, we love Acadia and, and uh, love seeing that. And, you know, I, I personally, I'm, I'm really happy and excited to see that you're actually able to do something with your finished pieces. Cause that's, for me, that's always been the question about time lapse as you go through all this long process and all this work to make it and then most time lapses you watch it in 15 30 seconds a little bit of music and it's done and that but you seem to have found some uh a way to take it further appreciate that yeah i, I would tell thank you uh lance one thing i would suggest um to photographers is you're right that people tend to always be longing for more to get a longer time lapse and what i would suggest is consider using a shorter interval that's basically the time between each photo so See if you can go on the shorter end, even you know, four to uh, five to ten seconds, and then you'll get more frames that can allow you to produce a longer video, or even slow it down in, in post. One of the things I often see, which I personally don't like, is when the time lapses seem too quick, and you don't you don't really get to to study it and see the you know the beauty of it. So I try to slow mine down usually um, to make it a little slower, even with a shorter interval. Okay. And um, uh, sorry, follow up question. I think I asked about the wrong software. <laughs> they want to know what's the uh, recovery software. Somebody else has some. Oh, the recovery cards. software. Um, yeah. So the recovery software is called. Um, oof. And it's funny because the name of it is not something that um, that makes it obvious. So I think that it's called. Uh, disk drill media recovery. Yeah. So there's a there's a few of them out there. They all do the same thing. Cleaner one, um, cleaner one, disk drill media recovery is the one that I had used to recover this, which was amazing. I think it's the best one I'd ever used. The disk drill one. Uh, right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, also, and it it's um, buried a little bit in the chat, but um, I wanted to I forgot to mention earlier that we posted a link to the uh, Starscapes two video on YouTube in the chat. So anybody who wants to go and check that out, please please do. Thanks, Lance. All right. Appreciate it. Well, thank thank you. Appreciate it. Um, we've got one more speaker to go, and that is Katrina Brown. Um, Katrina is a world traveler a commercial photographer and an avid California-based night photographer. And she likes to make her images rather than take them. I think, I don't know, I don't know for sure, but I, I think that in part has to do with vision and, and maybe in part with your process of, of uh, some of the more complex images that you make, but we'll let you tell that story. Um, so, um, Katrina enjoys what she calls the, the complex dance of choreographing different elements to create images that might otherwise seem impossible. Her images are often complex assemblages of different frames that take a lot of planning and coordination to execute. So creating, creating light when there isn't much available is her passion, and she loves to help others find their light as well. So tonight, she's going to break down um, a really stunning image for us and talk about the process of making it. So Katrina, you're a, you are another new face to us here at National Parks at Night in the Night, Night Photo Summit. Um, one, of our, one of our partners, Gabriel Biederman, found you on Instagram. And uh, thanks to Gabe for inviting you to join us here for the, the next summit. Um, we, uh, we're loving your work and we're keen to get to know you and, and more of your work. So um, I will Pop your image up here and you can take it away. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm honored to share the stage with such amazing artists. Um, I'm a little 
surprise to be here. I feel like uh, I'm newer in the game than these guys, but it, at the same time, I'm completely honored. So uh, most of my stuff is light painting and I combine it with night uh, stars and photography and things like that. But this particular image um, and also video, I'd like to talk about how I create these. First, my inspiration with the mirrors really came from two places. I'm sure everybody knows Joe McNally. He had done some pretty amazing, the mirrors were not broken, but they created like this infinity loop of, um, of imagery that he had shot. And I, I knew once I saw that, I knew I needed to do something with, with images. And I travel a lot to a place called East Jesus, which is out in the desert in California, where a lot of people make very strange art, uh, broken glass, discarded items. And I saw this ball that was made out of broken glass and, you know, took some selfies in it with some of my friends. And I just said, you know what, I have to do this. This is what I need to do with mirrors and the night. So the challenge was finding mirrors that are big enough and then breaking them. You wouldn't think that, that would be a challenge, but it is. So I would hit the thrift stores twice, three times a week, looking for big mirrors that weren't too expensive that I could break. And of course, the first couple I did, they would shatter too small, uh, break in ways that they would spider so they weren't usable. So after breaking about three or four really large ones, this these are the pieces I came up with. So I took it to Bombay Beach, which is uh, near Joshua Tree in California. It's a pretty unique area. And luckily this night, a lot of cars weren't driving on the beach, lighting things up, which is kind of rare. So I just have to spread it out, make sure that it looks good, obviously using photo pills to check my direction and, that, and such, and then set it up and let it run all night long. And even when I got home and assembled this together, I was really surprised and I really enjoyed it. And this is one of my most popular time lapses, I would have to say. So the one thing, though, that I like to do is I'm very efficient with how I shoot. I like to make as many products, so to speak, as possible that I can. So shooting with a one second interval and shooting at 20 ish seconds or less, one right after the other gives me three products. One is a obviously a point of light image, a star trail image as well. And then this motion uh, time lapse. Similar to the previous speaker, you assemble it. You can choose your frames per second to make it slow, medium, fast, whatever you'd like to do. And that's uh, a lot of my creative passion is not only making a time lapse, but getting three separate, completely different products out of one shooting session. So with that being said, I do want to give a shout out. I did see three people, Dan, Josh, and Vanessa, who are asking questions, who've been on my workshop. So I just want to say hello and thanks for joining. And I'm not quite sure what else to say. Uh, a lot of the other participants kind of touched on the same things. So if we wanted to jump to question and answer, do you think this is an appropriate time? Um, sure, sure. Um... Let's see. Uh, Andrea wants to know uh, what software you are using for your time lapses. Yes. Yeah, so it's I do it in the most simple way. I do teach a lot of workshops and I do work with a lot of people who are just starting out. So I stay really simple. So once you shoot your images and I clean up the airplanes, I'm pretty I'm pretty crazy about that. I, I clean every single image, even if there's 500 of them. So that when I assemble that, there's very little as possible. But I just assemble it using QuickTime, which is available in comes with the Mac, but you can also get it on your PC. And I do like it for its simplicity. Uh, you're not dealing with a whole lot of fancy software. It's not expensive or free in most cases. And it you can choose. Uh, there's a pro resolution, and there's also frames per second that you can choose, and it's pretty versatile that way and simple. Yeah, it's a pretty cool little program, and it's it's like you said, it's it's simple, it's easy, and if you don't need to do a whole lot, it's great. Right. Um, so um, here here's another very serious question: um, Are you worried about all the bad luck from breaking those mirrors? <laughs> well, it, sometimes my life can seem like a country song, you know, that nobody wants to hear. So I'm okay with it. There's <laughs> not much more, <laughs> not that much more I could do to make that a scary situation. <laughs> so it doesn't bother me at all. 
but yeah, well, I that, do get asked that a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, it is. It is a pretty stunning image for sure, and I I love the uh, the creativity that went into that, and um, fan, just fantastic. Um, how um, I'm curious, how much extra extra oomph did you have to add to the bottom part of the image to get the star trails and the mirrors to pop out so much? Um, you know, for the video, because I didn't touch up everyone on the star trail image, of course, I boosted using levels and, um, you know, maybe a little bit of a highlights tool, because you can see in the video that it's not quite as bright, but I did want those to stick out a little bit more. So just very simple highlight tool in Photoshop and brushing it over the flattened image, not one, each individual image, yep. um, and just kind of boosted that up a little bit. Cool, okay. Uh, Vanessa says, uh, I'm a big fan. I've, I've noticed you've been uh, an expert at those multiple work products out of one shoot. Um, how do you plan for a light painting, um, star trail and a time-lapse all in one? And, and how do you uh, reuse those files? I'm, I'm not quite sure, clarify, clarify what you mean by reusing files, but when I do plan for a light painting shoot and a star trail and a time lapse, it is a bit of a choreography type of situation. I make sure that my model is where or whatever I'm highlighting rock tree is in a position and I plan using the stars as a guide, um, which direction I want to be at using photo pills. Do I want a circle? Do I want the Milky Way? You know, do I want east west conver conversion? Do I want um, what motion do I want eventually? Because the star, just the star image alone um, is pretty simple. It's not that complicated as far as where they're at. But I think about the final product, where I'm going to place my focus model or rock or tree, and then make sure that that movement's going to look good with it. So as long as I'm thinking about the three or four steps ahead, what the circle or the movement of the stars are going to be, where I'm going to place my uh, light painted uh, part of my image, which this image doesn't have that, but um, that's how I pre-plan all of that. And I do all my light paintings first. You can do them at the beginning or the end. You would never do it in the middle. Otherwise, you would interrupt your star trail. And then it's a very simple layer change. Do not move your tripod or budge your camera whatsoever. And then you just pretty much mask on top of your time lapse or your star trail image the light painted version of it. And it's very simple because you're not compositing, you're just blending. So there's no lines to cut out. There's no lighting to worry about. You're just with a soft brush blending in and out with a mask on what you want to keep and what you want to get rid of. I hope that answers the question, Vanessa. Uh, I think about the, perhaps the, the reusing the files, maybe it's just a matter of, of keeping all the separate elements to be able to, you know, combine them or, or recombine them as you like just yeah that's yeah that, yes that's true so let's say I had put a model into this and had 20 shots that I really loved well I would mask the person or the object in there and I would save that as a PSD file somewhere else because what if I want to take another file maybe I didn't like today but I liked number 20 another day I keep that file so I just drag and drop it right on mask it in do what I'm going to do and save it as such Sure. Um, and June says, um, can you outline again the three separate uh, products or, or photos that you cut out of one shoot? Yes, June. So when you shoot the stars in such a way that they don't move, um, your single images are called point of light images, meaning it's just the stars. So they're not blurry. They're pretty sharp. And then when you're taking multiple shots like that, you combine all of those into a flat image and just change your layer blending mode to lighten. That gives you the star trail image. And then if you take those exact same files and you open them as an image sequence in uh, QuickTime, it turns it into a time-lapse video. So all those images that I spent three to four hours shooting give me three completely different products, a point of light image, a flat star trail image and a moving cinemagraph time lapse video. So I hope that helps. Yeah, um, yeah. The the last one I think you kind of just touched on that with uh, saying three to four hours. Um, follow up question from June. She wanted to know what was the total uh, time on on this image that we talked about tonight. 
Yes, um, I, I went to sleep in my truck and uh, it was about four hours total of the shooting time. And the longer you shoot, the more time you're gonna have for your video. And quite honestly, the better star trails look. Um, shooting an hour, an hour and a half, it's doable, but it doesn't look as pretty in my opinion. I like to go as long as possible. So if you have a battery pack, if you have anything that can make it last as long as possible, I highly suggest doing that. It's just, you have a lot more files to clean, a lot more airplanes to clean out. And like I said, I do it individually on each and every frame because of the video aspect of it. And um, so it can be a little overwhelming, but it does give you a much cleaner, better product in the end. Yeah. Um, and you gotta have two cameras if you're just gonna sit there for four hours too, right? Do you work with I multiple cameras? I take four, <laughs> only because I, I really like to make the most of my time. I'm really an efficient shooter. Um, you know, it takes a, it costs a lot of money to go out to a dark sky place, and especially if I'm, you know, taking a model, my daughter that I pay, <laughs> and uh, so I'll want to go set one camera up north, you know, doing a landscape north, one another way, getting the Milky Way over here while I'm light painting over here, and then I leave that camera to shoot all night long so that I can blend those star trails in. So um, yeah, I'm a little crazy, so <laughs> but that's why I have so much content because. Um, I don't know. I have more years behind than ahead, so I got some, you know, some time to catch up on. Yeah, um, I think we've crossed a lot of the same paths over over the years. I'm looking at your website earlier today. So very cool. Um, well, thank you so very very much, um, and uh, looking forward to the the full story next week. Um, thanks so much for for being here for being here tonight. And, and to all our speakers, I'm going to um, stop out now and hand it back over to Tim, who's going to wrap us wrap us up. And um, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, like all I can say is, wow, I feel super inspired. Uh, um, and it's uh, it's just great to see all of your work, some of it I've not seen before. So absolutely thrilled. And thank you uh, for everybody out in the audience uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, I hope you guys will stick around a little bit. Remember, we're going to have a little networking opportunity uh, right after this is over. <clears throat> and we'll give you some instructions on on how to get to that. And you're going to eventually go back to the web page. Um, but, uh, but right now, what we have, and Lance, I think I'm turning this back over to you or Matt, but it's time for our giveaway. So tonight we've got uh, uh, a couple of flashlights from uh, one of our favorite flashlight companies, uh, uh, Coast, who's a sponsor for uh, next week's event um, and our sponsor year round. We love their their products. Um, so three flashlights we're giving away tonight. And um, I think we've got a really cool new tool uh, called the uh, Wheel of Names, which we're going to break out for this. Yes. And I need a minute because I'm making sure that I got everybody that that's here. Mm. Uh, in there so um let's let's talk about a couple of other things while i finish putting this stuff together okay got to be here to win i guess that's, that's right got to be here that's to win thing, right got to be here to win uh, if, yeah. I, if a uh, name right. is chosen if a name is chosen that <laughs> that was here and left you don't win oh i'm yeah here. you've, you've got to answer the call <laughs> once we once we pull your name out <laughs> that's um, it yeah and hey spe speaking of uh speaking of giveaways yes. um Everybody who's registered for the summit, or even if you're not, go and, and take a look at the uh, the website. We have a page uh, with a listing of all the product and service giveaways that are going to be part of the Night Photo Summit. Uh, we're adding more every day as various sponsors come in and uh, and donate products to our uh, attendees. So that that was um, a huge uh, thing, part of our closing ceremony last year. Um, where Gabe, our MC master, uh, hosts a, a wrap-up party. But we had, um, oh my gosh, I, I, dozens and dozens of, of prizes giving away from you know lenses and tripod heads, flashlights and uh, astro camera modifications, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, um, so it was over, uh, last year was over $10,000 worth of gear we gave away on that last night. So um <laughs> check it check it out um we have our sponsors are listed and our 
our philosophy about sponsorship is that they should provide benefits to you, our attendees, more than more than to us. It's it's to bring value, added value to our events. So um, you know, we're really grateful to all of our longtime sponsors. We've got uh, BenQ displays at Coast, the flashlights that we're giving away tonight. B and H has been a huge supporter of us. <gasps> So uh, hey, there's there's the wheel of names. The wheel of names. Oh, oh nice. nice! I have so many windows open. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, I see. You can't Carl. believe. It. Okay, all right. Because yeah, everybody see I the see wheel a few of names. People I know. Are we seeing the wheel of names clearly? We yeah. are. Okay. Mesmerizing. Ooh, look at this! Uh, so don't give one to my mom. <laughs> all right. So well, there we go. So I have. I have all the people that registered. That's just a quirk of of Zoom. Um, so if somebody if somebody's name comes up that was here and had to leave, I'm so sorry. Uh, we're gonna have to. So what we're gonna do is, if your name comes up and you win, we're gonna have you use raise hand, and we're gonna look for your name in the attendee list. And if that happens, make sure you stick around so that we can get a little bit more information from you. We'll use the private chat to do that uh, so that we can get your prize to you. I'm starting to get dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> and but since but that, the, was, that was probably a pre-existing condition, so. Possibly, possibly. And also I have to delete one name here. The name Test is in here, so I'm going to oh. Test out of there. Oh, that's my cousin. <laughs> and sorry all the speakers here we love you but um unfortunately you're also in as illegible as uh lance and tim and i are also so oh, sorry. Uh, sorry katrina um we're gonna I, try I, I would like to to tell you that i'm i'm happy that i'm not the only nutbag with four cameras out there <laughs> yay <laughs> yay oh my brother from another mother <laughs> yeah <laughs> It All sure right. is fun. So, Lance, what is our first uh, our prize? Our first prize that we're giving away. Uh, our first prize, actually, we have two of the same. And here, hang on a second. Um, I don't know if this is very helpful or not, but <laughs> it is a 100th anniversary Coast flashlight and uh, pocket knife set. I'm spinning. Um, yeah. I'm so we spitting. got two of those, flashlight and knife set. The wheel says, Ray McDonald. Ray, if you are here, please raise your Golf hand. Clap. Golf clap. Do we see Ray McDonald raising Ray's hand in the attendees? Ray, are you present? I know Ray if he left, so. Well, he's got <laughs> one of my present. friends. I invited him. Oh, <laughs> oh been... no. Oh, loophole. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll we'll hang in there, and we'll do the other two. If he doesn't raise his hand by then, okay. Yeah. Next one coming. Uh, Jennifer, Jennifer, if you're here, hey, Jennifer. Jennifer Wills. I oh, see we have a raised hand, hand, I believe. We've Ooh. got a winner there, Jennifer. We have a winner. Excellent. So you definitely get the Coast 100th anniversary pack. Right. Excellent. Super cool. sweet and flashlight. All right. So All right. we're and spinning again for the next one because Ray's the, not here. Sorry, Ray. The next one is an FL75 rechargeable flash uh, headlight from Coast. Oh, Franco. Franco, are you here? Ah, right. uh, yes. Here. Here. I saw your right. hand, but your hand went down, but you're here. That's great. All right. There it so is. Lance, fantastic. All right. So, Lance, judgment call. Are we, are we going to, uh, are we going to spin again? Since we well, only call, three call them out one more time. Ray McDonald. Ray McDonald going once. Ray McDonald going twice. Ray McDonald going three times. Ah, bummer. So sorry, Ray. We'll find. Well, well, there's, there's more chances to win more, stuff during exactly. The there's yep. lots more prizes on the yep. uh, on sun, next Sunday night. But we did find Jennifer and we did find Franco. All right. So one Fantastic. more name. One more name. Here we go. Give it a last spin. winner. Last winner. Last winner. It's exciting. Missy, Missy Fuller, Missy are you Fuller. here? No, 
All right. Missy is here. Congratulations, Ooh. Missy. All what right. does Missy win? Missy wins the uh, comp the hundredth anniversary knife and flashlight combo. Okay. Very all cool. right. All right. So okay. we have all of this information. Um, so we will. What we will do is we'll just do. We'd like you guys to. Um, we'd say send us your email in a chat, but we can find your emails from the registration, and we'll make sure that you have that just in case. We're going to put uh, an email here so that you guys can send us that. It's adventure at nationalparksatnight.com. Um, if you don't hear from us, send us an email. At, oops, I just sent it to the wrong people. I sent it to host. The panel I've got that address already, Matt. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so, Jennifer, Missy, Franco, uh, if you don't hear from us by tomorrow, then just send us an email. We'll take care of getting that information from you because chances are we have your email address anyway. Okay. So I'm going to stop the screen share now. Tim, what else do we have to say before we uh, take this in for a landing? Well, you know, mainly just some some big thank yous. Uh, Pete, Susan, Katrina, Noel, Kevin, thank you guys so much for coming out. What a great kickoff to our uh, to our event next week. Um, really appreciate it, you guys. Thanks for being here, and for yeah, all the uh, you know for fun. everybody that joined us. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you all had a a great time and. Uh, for those of you who are uh, registered for next week, yes, can't wait to see y'all. Um, for the folks that aren't registered, if there's anybody out there, still plenty of time to do so. All right. Um, you know, go back to the Night Photo Summit website and sign up. Um, it's going to be an amazing weekend. This is our third uh, third event, uh, third time running this. Um, and each year has been just fantastic. Uh, you know, it's just week fill or a weekend filled with education and and inspiration um, starts next Friday, right? Runs through Sunday. Um, we've got uh, over 35 presenters. Uh, let's see, I think over 40 classes, um, panel discussion, uh, image review. If you guys want to submit some images, you can, uh, we'll be uh, taking a look at them and giving constructive feedback on those. Uh, as Lance mentioned, we got tons and tons of giveaways and, uh, and uh, of products and all sorts of things. And, uh, you're welcome to go to the uh, Night Photo Summit page right now, and you can check those out for sure. Um, see what's in the offering, um, and uh, let's see what else. Well, in in addition to that, um, many of our sponsors will have a virtual exhibitor booth, so mm. you can go in and ask questions about their the gear and the products that they have. Say uh, like Spencer's camera, um, if you're interested in uh, astro modifications. Clarence Spencer will be there in the in the virtual booth and able to answer answer questions about the the process and the cost and what's involved with doing astro mods and um, uh, B and H will have a booth uh, BenQ I believe as well so um, just lots lots of learning opportunities um, and the other thing uh, we ought to mention this is a live virtual three day event but everybody who's registered will have access to all the classes for a full year mm -hmm. until next, next year's summit launches. So um, we've got three simultaneous tracks going most of the days, sometimes two, but mostly three tracks running. Um, you can't watch them all at the same time. So just know that everything is recorded and you'll have year long access to everything for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can't think of anything else. I think one thing. All one right. Thing. If you have more questions and you want to hang out with some of these lovely people, we're going to have a networking room open right now. In fact, it's open already. So if you guys, if anybody feels like hanging out and chatting a little bit more, I know that the chat being busted here tonight uh, was a little disappointing. It won't be uh, during the future sessions. We found that setting and somehow a little tick box got checked or unchecked that shouldn't have been so don't worry about it during the summit everybody will have the ability to chat with everybody but now you can do a little face-to-face -face, uh video chat we have uh three rooms open and we're just posted the the link in the chat so open the chat go click on that link and we hope to see some or all of you and you can invite your friends too <laughs> i'll just go have like you know some friday night cocktails and talk about Mm -hmm. stars and galaxies and comets and deep space and astro landscape and light painting and all the lovely things that we love doing 
So we hope that you fire, is. right, Kevin? Airplanes. Yeah, you got it, man. Bombs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. We want to see you guys over in the networking rooms. Let's go hang out and have some fun because uh, it's been it's been fun sharing and fun receiving. But now we can have conversations. Sound good? All right. And if you don't if you don't see the chat or you don't have access to that, just go to the home page and there's a menu item at the top networking room. Yep. It says networking right up at, in yep. the top menu. Yep. So we'll see you at nightphotosummit.com. All right. Awesome. Thank Great. you. Everybody. Nice to meet nice you over there. Yeah. Nice All to right. meet you. Thanks everybody for All being right. here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye.